Well, Dr. Nichols, it is so good to have you here in the Ars Ligonier studio once again. It's great to be with you, Nathan. And it's actually good to be in an air-conditioned studio. <laughs> That's right. Um, you're a church historian. You're often recording five minutes in church history on the road. Uh, when Ligonier travels, sometimes we have the opportunity to record on location. And just last month, you and I were in London, and we were filming there uh, at uh, the Tower of London. Right. And it happened to be the hottest week. The hottest I know, week. The hottest week of, of the year in London. <laughs> Maybe for many decades Maybe. the hottest week. So we left Florida, the heat of Florida, went right. with all of these clothes to keep ourselves warm, <clears throat> but we're sweating there in London. Uh, but we recorded a number of, of videos and yeah. I particularly appreciated the conversation we had about Lady Jane Grey mm, and right. hearing uh, her story, her testimony, uh, and then being there very close to where she was executed. Uh, so I would encourage those that are watching live, if they go to Ligonier's YouTube channel and simply search for Remembering Lady Jane Grey, they can see that, that conversation. Mm. Uh, but I, I suspect we're going to talk a little bit about church history tonight. I hope so. Particularly because next Tuesday yes. is Reformation Day. And so I want to begin with the first question before we get to some of the questions okay. that those that are watching live have, are submitting. And I'm wondering, when Martin Luther was walking to the castle church and he was nailing those 95 theses there in 1517, did he have any idea what was going to happen, the, the reformation that would come to the church, uh, even the effects on Western society that mm. occurred due to the reformation. Did he have any idea? You know, I think about that moment, uh, that event, so many times. We were there, uh, we've walked it, you yeah. know, going, going out of the black cloister, down the road uh, to the castle church. Of course, the wooden doors, Luther would have nailed the 95 theses to, are long gone. Uh, but you just want to recreate that moment uh, because it was such a crucial moment, not only in the history of the church, but for, for world history. But I, I don't think Luther had any idea. He wanted to be faithful to what he knew at the time. And he still had a lot to learn. But he had been studying the text. He had been reading Augustine. He'd been pouring over Paul, looking at what was going on in the church. <clears throat> and I think he was motivated solely by the desire to be faithful because he just saw so much incongruity with what was being practiced in his church and what he was learning from the pages of Scripture. And he was really compelled to do that. Now, did he have any idea what would come of that? You know, I just, I don't think so. But he was the right man for the job, uh, that's for sure. All right, well, let's get to some of the questions that those that are watching live are submitting. And I would remind you, if you want to ask questions of Dr. Nichols tonight, just leave a comment in the live stream or use the hashtag AskLigonier wherever you're watching on social media. Well, our first question, Dr. Nichols, is from David. He's watching on Facebook. And David would like to know, how did Luther's view of election differ from Kelvin's view? We're sticking on the Luther theme. <clears throat> You know, their views on election weren't, weren't all that different. Um, they had differences. The most marked one is probably the Lord's Supper. Uh, they had different views of politics. Uh, Luther thought, if you were good at nothing else, go ahead and get into politics. Uh, Luther, or Calvin rather, thought politics was a high calling. So they had disagreements. But on election, they were fairly in sync. Now, Calvin is more clear and the development of what we would call double predestination. It doesn't mean Luther would have rejected it. Uh, much of later Lutheranism does, but it's probably a case of where he was in the development of that doctrine. But God is sovereign over all, or he's not. That position was held by Luther. That position was held by Calvin. Uh, so that's behind election. And both of them saw election as necessary to justification. So I'd say there's far more in common between the two uh, than a difference on, on the topic of election. Yeah. Well, this next question is from Matthew. Matthew would like to know, what would you say to a Roman Catholic who seems to have animosity towards Martin Luther? Hmm. I don't know if I'd start with Luther. <laughs> I, might, I might just start with, you know, the text. Um, but I think I would say, what, what was Luther trying to do? He was really trying to be faithful 
to the teaching of the Word of God. So he didn't set out to dismantle the church. In fact, Luther really wanted to reform the church. He believed in the church. He saw himself as a son of the church. Um, even early on, now very, very quickly he's going to start calling the Pope the Antichrist, but early on he says of Leo that he wished he was a Pope in a different time because he believed him to have some character and so forth. Um, but he, he really wanted to reform within. He was kicked out of the church. Um, so, so I would maybe stress that. And again, I would, I would probably say, let's, let's talk about the text and let's talk about what really motivated Luther to start those reforms. And it's the question of how am I made right before God? And we all have to answer that question because it is the fundamental question that all of us have to face. And Luther just wants to be very clear. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And the Roman Catholic Church is not clear on that subject and not putting a period after sola. Well, here's a question from Timothy. He's watching on X, the social media platform formerly known as Twitter. Uh, and Timothy would like to know, what is the difference between the Protestant Reformation and the various restorationist movements in church history? Well, especially if you're talking about the American restorationist movement, it was very much a uh, view of, of we receive the Bible in a vacuum. We don't necessarily need to be thinking about previous church councils, uh, previous works from church history, the, the Barton, Stone, Campbell, um, restoration, restorationist movement in America was very much in a vacuum coming to the Bible without those intervening centuries of church history. Uh, the reformers actually valued church history. One of the pieces Luther wrote was on the councils and the church. And it wasn't throwing out 1,600 years of church history. Uh, he recognized that God worked through church history and that through faithful theologians, faithful pastors, faithful church leaders, there was good teaching there that the church could draw upon. And we don't come to this in a vacuum. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not a gift to the 21st century church. Uh, the Holy Spirit has been a gift to the church, well, going back to the Garden of Eden, but <laughs> back to the first century on, if we're talking about church history. So that's, that's one of the differences. I think the other difference is when you get to the Reformation, it really is about doctrine. So it's thinking through the doctrine of justification as we just talked about, the doctrine of election, um, the doctrine of scripture, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of the Trinity. You don't see as rigorous theological reflection in some of these uh, restoration movements. You had the opportunity to work with Dr. Sproul and mm -hmm. edited a book titled The mm -hmm. Legacy of Luther. What, right. what is the legacy of Luther? Well, it's in bringing such crystallized expression to the doctrines that matter the most. And we have this wonderful structure of the solas as a paradigm to get at this. But to say we're talking about the doctrine of the authority of Scripture, and then we're talking about the doctrine of salvation, which has grace and faith in Christ rightly understood. And that's the central truth of what it means to be a Christian. And when you look at the reformers, they differed on a lot of things. They differed on, and we do, we differ on uh, church politics. We differ on the, the uh, sacraments, as we've discussed. We differ on some of the finer points of the, once you get into the tall grass of theology. But what holds us together as historic, as committed to historic Christian orthodoxy is that commitment to the solas. And that was so crucial to Luther. So there's this teaching, but the other thing is the person and the boldness and the courage. And that's so much the legacy of Luther. I mean, you think about this, you brought up the 95 Theses. This is, this is one person standing against the church that you know, blocks the sun uh, because of its power and size. And related to that is the Holy Roman Empire, which historians do say, well, it wasn't very holy, it wasn't very Roman, wasn't much of an empire, but nevertheless, there were kings and armies. And this is what Luther's standing against. I mean, that's boldness and that's courage. And I think we can get steel in our spines uh, from that, that legacy 
of Luther. And then just one last point. Luther was the whole person. Uh, he laughed. He cried. He had moments of elation. He had serious moments of depression. He had victory and triumph in his life, and he had loss. He lost an infant. He buried his 12-year-old daughter. So, you know, as we look to Luther, this, this isn't a flat character encyclopedia entry. This is a three-dimensional, red-blooded, full-bodied uh, Christian person who's living out his discipleship. So I find Luther very commendable, and I think that's all part of his legacy. Well, for those that are watching live, we're actually making the book that you and Dr. Sproul edited, The Legacy of Luther, the ebook edition of that, free for you to download. If you go to ask.ligonier.org slash offer, you can request your copy of The Legacy of Luther, as I said, edited by Dr. Sproul and Dr. Nichols. And that's just our way of saying thank you for watching live and for leaving all of the comments uh, in, the, in the comment section, all your questions in the comment section. Well, we have another question, this time from Hope on Instagram, and Hope would like to know, are there any prominent women from church history who were influential in the Reformation? So there were women who were influential in their own right, and the one was the aforementioned Lady Jane Grey. So through a series of sort of relatives to the throne, once Edward VI dies, the next heir is Mary. The problem is she's Catholic. So there was a move to put Lady Jane Grey on the throne. And she was England's queen for all of nine days. And then in comes Mary's troops. She routes Jane's troops, and Jane goes into the Tower of London. But we have to take a step back. She taught herself Greek so she could read the New Testament. And she's corresponding with the reformer Martin Bootser on the best way to learn Hebrew so she could read the Old Testament in the original languages, all at the age of 16. She sounds like a great candidate for Reformation I, Bible You college. know, I would give her a scholarship. <laughs> I mean, she might not need one, <laughs> but I'd give her a scholarship. But then she's put on trial for her life. And, and the, the recently reinstalled Roman Catholic Archbishop uh, Freckenham comes in to quiz her. He's, you know, trained and he's got all his entourage with him. She, she is nothing and she's on trial for her life. And he starts going after doctrine of justification and saying, we must be saved by works, right? And she goes, I deny that. Which is, I deny that and I affirm justification by grace. And she has this wonderful line, she says, uh, and then he says uh, to her about, well, well, James mentions works, works must certainly count for something. And she said, they do. They are tokens of our obedience out of gratitude for what Christ has done. But may we never say that works save us. And then she says, and when we have done all, we are but poor sinners and Christ's blood alone can save us. I mean, that is uh, such a beautiful and very accurate articulation of the doctrine, the central and essential doctrine of justification by faith. And there it is, Lady Jane Grey. Uh, the other uh, figure who's also royal is Queen Jean of Navarre. And Navarre was a region in Fran between France and Spain, and it was the place where the Calvinist and Reformed view really flourished under her reign. And it was a time of great gospel advancement under Queen Jean. And then not only are there women who served in their own right, but we have to acknowledge the wives. And one of my favorites uh, is we Brandis Rosenblatt, who ends up being married pretty much to the Reformation. She had uh, four husbands, they all died. They were all reformers. Her final husband was Martin Bootser. Um, but just to, you know, we all know uh, how important wives are to the work that is done. And we also have to mention on that score, Katie. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine Luther without Katie uh, behind him. So yes, women played a key role uh, in the Reformation and thankful for how God used them. Well, Raul on Facebook, he's asking, did the Reformation have influence outside of Europe and the Western world? What about the Eastern Church? 
Yeah, it did. <clears throat> largely through mission work and largely through students coming to the centers, Geneva and Wittenberg. So students came from the Eastern, Europe, Eastern European countries, Poland, Hungary, uh, even into Russia, came to Geneva and studied took the reform teaching back. In fact, there was a Polish confession of faith called the Kinchow from a town in Poland confession written in 1599. It was written by students of Calvin who had been at Geneva and went to Poland. And uh, this wonderful Polish confession of faith long before the Westminster standards. Uh, same thing in Hungary, uh, a Hungarian statement of faith. And there were Hungarians that studied both at Wittenberg and at, um, at Geneva, also up into the Norwegian lands. It was largely, though, mission endeavors. And there were some places that were successful, and especially in regions where the particular noble or duke or whatever the power may be were uh, favorable towards the Reformation. But it was also times of martyrdoms for these students who went back as missionaries and gave their lives to try to take the faith back to their countrymen. But not a lasting reformation. Uh, where, where the European reformation had its effect, of course, was in the New World. And so when you look at the settlements of the colonies on the eastern seaboard of the United States, you can trace them back to the different Reformation branches. So the New England Puritans, of course, are from the English Puritans of the English Reformation. The middle colonies are populated by Dutch and the Scotch Presbyterian who through Geneva, through Scotland to America. And the South, of course, are the Anglicans of the Anglican Reformation again of England. So that's where you see a sort of worldwide push uh, from the European Reformation. What are some of the ways the Reformation did influence the development of Western society outside of the doctrine of justification or authority? Yeah, there's the old Weber Tawny thesis that sees Calvinism and the Reformation behind the rise of capitalism. One way was the Reformers did away with a lot of the holy days, holidays that the church celebrated. And one medieval historian estimated that there was pretty much a holiday for every day of the year in the calendar by the time you got to the era of the Reformation because every saint had a holiday. Well, it's hard to be a productive society if you have, you know, 150 holidays. So when the reformers come along and say, it's Sunday, that's the Lord's Day, the week is for work, uh, you're going to increase productivity. Um, the Reformers' doctrine of vocation. Uh, prior to the Reformers, if you wanted to do a job that mattered, you enter the monastery, you enter the priesthood. Uh, others just sort of put in time. The Reformers come along and give us this wonderful doctrine of vocation, and now all of a sudden, being a merchant, being a shipbuilder, being a bricklayer, being a farmer can be done for the glory of God. And this is what Paul says, as unto the Lord, He's not talking to just pastors there at Ephesians. He's talking about workers, all of us. We do our work as unto the Lord. So that doctrine of vocation is certainly going to spur on productivity, etc. So we see it in economics. We see it in the home. Uh, you know, Geneva was one of the first places to put on the books laws against wife beating. And in Geneva and in Germany, there were laws to protect wives in terms of inheritance rights. So if a husband died, the brother or the son would have more right to the inheritance than the wife. And many times, wives were sort of left. And if they had a gracious son or a gracious family, they were taken care of. But some of them were left in rather precarious positions. And so coming out of the Reformation, we have laws that protect the inheritance rights of women. So uh, there were a number of things uh, that were very much not just the theological contribution, but what we could call social and cultural contributions that the reformers made. And I think these days people are pretty reluctant to give them credit for some of those things. We need to remember it. Grace on YouTube is wanting to know, in what ways can the study of church history deepen our knowledge of God and our relationship with Him? I think it shows God's faithfulness. You know, uh, when we look at the Old Testament, we hear about the attributes of God. We hear about His character. We hear that He's faithful. And then what do we see? We see it played out 
in the narratives of the Old Testament saints. We see it played out in Abraham and in Isaac and in Jacob. Even in their unfaithfulness, we see God's faithfulness played out. Um, so those stories in the Bible really help us see the covenant being manifested and demonstrated and seeing the covenant God demonstrated in our lives. Same is true for church history. Uh, what we see in church history is faithful servants, but what we really see is the faithfulness of God. And, you know, we look around in our moment and we can be a little discouraged. But here's the good news. We've been here before. The church has actually been here before. Go back to the 420s and the sack of Rome and the vandals are at the gate and all of civilization looks like it's going to, you know, go under. And what do we do? Well, the church marches on and God is faithful. And, you know, what church history teaches us far more important than the notion that we've been here before is that God has been here before and God goes before us. Uh, so I think it can be very encouraging, these stories of church history, to remind us, yes, of faithfulness, yes, of courage, yes, of boldness, standing for the truth, all those things. Here I stand, Martin Luther. But what it really teaches us is the faithfulness of our God. Amen. Uh, Dee on YouTube is asking, what is one of your favorite moments from church history? That's a dangerous question to ask a church historian. Um, yeah. But depending on how long your answer is, maybe there's a couple of favorite moments. Well, we already talked about the 95 Theses. Mm -hmm. if, we're talk if we stick with Luther for a moment, it's Worms and the Here I Stand speech. But, you know, it, at heart, it, it's for me, it's American church history. So I would have loved to be not at one of Edward's Great Awakening sermons, not at the preaching of sinners of the hands of an angry God. If there's one moment I could transport myself to in place and time, it's Stockbridge, Massachusetts. It's the 1750s. It's a Sunday morning. Uh, one of the Stockbridge Mohicans goes to the porch of the church, blows into a conch shell, Nathan, to alert everyone that it's time for church. So they start coming out of their crudely constructed log cabins and teepees and make their way to church. And Edwards preaches a sermon with a translator to the Stockbridge Mohicans. I would love to be able to spend a Sunday in 1750s Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Just teleport there, just one Sunday. <laughs> what about another moment from church history? Well, let's go a little bit forward, shall we? Um, I think one of my other heroes, and it's a good year for him, is Machen. It's the year we celebrate Christian liberalism. But I'm going to go to a different kind of moment for Machen. So Machen wrote Christian liberalism, classic text. He also wrote some scholarly texts, The Virgin Birth of Christ, The Origin of Paul's Religion. These are heavy duty books, lots of footnotes, lots of research. He was a busy man, busy at Princeton. Then when he goes to Westminster, he's an administrator, lots of meetings, lots of fundraising, trying to hire faculty. I'm just saying I can sort of relate. <laughs> and so what would he do? He would go down to the Hotel DuPont in Wilmington, Delaware, to write chapters for his books, like The Virgin Birth. And we know this because he's sending letters to people on Hotel DuPont stationery saying, I managed to get away. I'm about to finish chapter six of The Virgin Birth. So I would just like to sit and visit with Machen and sort of sit in the corner and cheer him on as he finishes his chapter and recognize that sometimes it's the platform moments, but also, sometimes it's just the quiet labors of these saints who are faithful with the gifts God gives them, and they use them, and they have real impact on real lives. It's very exciting for me. I've heard you talk about and teach about Luther a lot and, and Machen. And something that's interesting, I found, <laughs> what you've taught about their lives, is that both of their deaths, so Luther goes back to his birthplace, yes. ends up dying. Yes. And Machen takes this trip in the winter Middle and dies. Middle of nowhere. Yes. So, um, why didn't you say you wanted to just Dakota. teleport back 
to those dates and say, don't, don't go on that trip. Don't go. God has our days numbered, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I remember uh, with Dr. Sproul one time talking about Edward's, and somebody mentioned Edward's untimely death. <laughs> and, of course, Dr. Sproul would say, really? Really? It was untimely? <laughs> so, yes, uh, you know, could we change history and stop Machen from getting, actually, John Murray, his colleague in theology at Westminster, tried. He tried to keep him from going on that train at Philadelphia that ended up in North Dakota uh, because he knew he was overtired mm. and uh, susceptible to, to pneumonia, and that's, that's what did it. So if Murray would have not, if Murray wasn't successful, I, sh I certainly wouldn't have been either. But a reminder Nathan. that we need good friends. We do. We need good friends. We speak also. wisdom into our lives. That's right. That's right. Well, Todd is watching on X tonight, and he'd like to know, is Reformed theology relevant to our everyday lives? What are some practical applications of Reformed theology? God is the center of Reformed theology. Reformed theology begins and ends in God, and there's nothing more practical to our daily lives than to have a God centered life. It gives perspective to everything. It, it keeps us, our tendency is to be self-centered. Um, back to Luther, Luther spoke of incarvitis, which I always think sounds like something the dentist tells you <laughs> that you have somewhere back there on the eighth molar or something. You got an incurvitis. It's not what it means. It means incurved. It's the self turned inward. It's it's a self-focus, and we do this, and, and we do this two ways. We do this self-turned inward, woe is me, everyone treats me terribly, nothing goes my way, everything's unfair, and we do it the opposite way. I am the master of everything, and I deserve everything, and we're, you know, presumption. Wow. Having a God-centered life really cuts across both. It keeps us from getting too full of ourselves. It also keeps us from sinking too low and recognizing that God is at the center. So Reformed theology is the most practical theology. Now, sometimes Reformed theologians can get a little into the minutia and don't always help people connect the dots to life. And that's sort of shame on us uh, because our theology really does connect to life. And we need to be sure as theologians and church leaders and pastors, uh, teachers, uh, that we are helping people see that connection. But yeah, I think fundamentally we're far better off as Reformed theologians than any other branch of theology when it comes to connecting it to our daily lives. I think it was Charles Spurgeon that said, it's the doctrine of God's sovereignty upon which the believer lays their head down at yes. night, the pillow upon which we sleep. Yeah, I could yeah. not imagine going to sleep at night, believing that the world was random, chaotic, that God doesn't control everything, and He couldn't or wouldn't intervene in events of the night or when you're in the midst of suffering. Absolutely. And it, you know, if it, because God is sovereign, we talk about monergism. The opposite is cooperation and synergism. Synergism, by the way, is the Greek, coopera, is the Latin, same word. I'm glad it's not cooperation. We, we know if it was cooperation, we wouldn't be getting anywhere. So it's very reassuring. The sovereign monergistic work of God is incredibly reassuring. Yeah, that, that Spurgeon quote is a really good one. Nothing more practical than that. And you think of even Lady Jane Grey, yes. and as she's standing there giving a defense of her life, you want to know, yes, it's the God who justifies, and she's believing the gospel, but knowing that God is in control of her fate, whether she lives or dies, as you said, there are no untimely deaths. The Lord has numbered her days. Yes. Like, it does give us a boldness, really practically, in day-to-day -day life. No, and even, you know, it helps us in evangelism. Mm -hmm. It reminds us that it's not up to us to somehow figure it out and, you know, say the exact right word, or if, if someone doesn't seem receptive to the gospel, you know, it's on us. We can. We need to be faithful. We, you and I, we do these always ready conferences, so we need to be prepared and we need to be students. But it's so reassuring to be able to say, there's our part, which is the proclamation, and then there's God's part. So it helps in so many areas, a God-centered theology. It's very, very practical. 
Adrian on Facebook would like to know, how can pastors help a congregation understand the importance that church history plays? So the first part is just use church history stories as illustrations. They're great stories. Everyone loves a good story, and church history is full of them. So we can begin to use church uh, history stories and church history figures as illustrations. And, you know, not always that they always get it right. It's okay to also show where they were the missteps because we can learn from the missteps and it's also okay to show their weakness to remind us that even in our weakness right that's where god manifests his strength so i would say use church history stories uh secondly we, we do have things like reformation sunday so i think it's good to talk about reformation day on reformation sunday um, i think we can also bring into the church especially in sunday school settings uh, series on church history and series on faithful leaders and faithful figures from the past. So there are very tangible ways uh, that pastors can put church history figures in front of. Pastors have uh, social media accounts. They can quote church history figures, especially if their folks in their congregation are following them. They can quote church history figures. Um, one of the things I recommend to people too is in pastors can do this too, is recommend the sermons of church history figures as great entry points, because sometimes lay people don't always know where to go. And if someone for the first time picks up bondage of the will or religious affections or Calvin's institutes without a roadmap and without some context, it can be very easy to sort of get lost in that. But sermons, they're compact. They're filled with passion and they have calls to action, right? So pastors recommending sermons from these church history figures. It could, there's just many ways uh, that it can be done and can be done effectively and well because what we're after is being faithful disciples in the 21st century and church history gives us examples of faithful disciples from the previous 20 centuries. Now, if someone's wanting to hear some examples of church history, stories from church history, and they only have a few minutes, maybe they only have five minutes, <laughs> is there a podcast that you would recommend people listen to? I'm, I'm not sure if there is one that fits that bill. Yeah. So honestly, I, you know, back we were together. I remember our first conversation about five minutes before it was five minutes. And one of the ideas is I don't want to turn people off to church history. I want to get them interested in church history and who doesn't have five minutes in a week? And I'd much rather somebody say, oh, I wish I was a little bit longer than, hmm, went on a little too long. Uh, but it, it can be done. And that's what I'm saying, even just to use in sermons, stories. It's amazing what little seeds can do. You know, even for young people, just those seeds of church history, those names, those stories that can stay with them and go with them. But, you know, it doesn't have to be heavy academic tomes and long drawn out lectures for us to be able to benefit from these folks from the past. Well, I know you're, you're not going to plug it, but Five Minutes in Church History, I encourage you to search for it wherever you listen to podcasts. It is five minutes every week. Dr. Nichols has been doing this for over 10 years. I like to say that you were podcasting before podcasting That's was great. cool. Before it was cool. Yes, and there are young children, there are families, uh, there are pastors listening every week, being reminded of some of the people, places, even documents. That's really part of our family history. So right. I commend it to everybody that's watching. Uh, but the next question is from Alex. Alex is on Facebook, and they'd like to know, what effect did the Reformation have on Christian worship? Everything. In fact, uh, you know, a few decades in, Calvin is asked to sort of present on the Reformation. And basically, you know, why all the fuss? Why do we go to all this trouble? And Calvin makes an interesting comment. So on the necessity of reforming the church is the name of the document if somebody wants to, if Alex wants to go and check it out. Um, but he says, the whole church from top to bottom was corrupt in its worship. And what needed to be done was a reforming of a misformed church on its worship. So if you pressed Calvin into the corner, he would say, the reason is worship. Now, now we're back to if that's the reason, now, what are the benefits that the Reformation brings to our worship? Well, number one, it's God-centered versus man-centered. So this is true of the doctrine of salvation. 
but it's through all the way through. It's through what church is about. It's, it's through what the purpose of the priesthood is about, not self-aggrandizement and wealth and stature and everyone, you know, bowing down and kissing rings. And it's the priesthood is there to serve the people of God and the worship of God. So that's why we have pastors. Um, the worship of the church service was, or the, the worship service was reformed. You know, let's say in the Middle Ages, you went to church and you were moved by what God had done for you and you just wanted to express your gratitude and sing. You couldn't. It was church choirs that sang. The reformers gave us, re, re-gave to us congregational worship. Think about that this Sunday, Reformation Day, when you stand up and you sing hymns in your congregation. Thank God for the reformers, right? And then the worship service sounds like, you know, uh, just mixed up words, can't even make any sense of it, because it's Latin. And none of these folks, many of them were not literate, but they certainly didn't speak in Latin. So they come into the church service, they don't even understand what's taking place. And what do the reformers do? They return the service to the language of the people. And then at the center of our worship is knowing who God is. And we know who God is primarily through his word. But again, the words in Latin, illiterate culture, long come the reformers. First it's the German translation, uh, then it's French, then it's English, then it's the education and the literacy rates, like this is another cultural contribution of the reformers we could go back and capture. Literacy climbs from being single digits to like in Scotland, for instance, almost reaches 100% literacy uh, during the era of John Knox. Why, right? So we can read the word of God, so we can know who God is, so we can worship him aright. So that was a great question. Worship was at the center of what the reformers were doing and why they were doing it and coming out of the Reformation, just so many returns to the pure biblical forms of the right worship of God. Jay asking us on X, what are some classic books from the Reformation era that you recommend for Christians to read today? Yes, yeah, so there's Luther's Three Treatises, uh, which has the freedom of the Christian or sometimes it's called uh, Christian liberty and his advice to the princes, uh, the German princes, and then, well, great title, The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. <laughs> so, you know, first of all, you're saying captivity, which is bad. Babylon never comes off well in the pages of scripture. So classic Luther, the three treatises, sometimes they're published together. It's a wonderful text. Luther's Bondage of the Will is, is, some, is some heavy duty theological lifting, but Luther was very clear and so it's just a wonderful discussion for Luther. The doctrine of election, he said, was the, the centerpiece of the table. And so the bondage of the will. You go to Calvin, it's Calvin's Institutes. But I would come back to the sermons. You can find the sermons of Luther online. You can find the sermons of Calvin online. You can find the sermons of the English reformers, the English Puritans online. And so those are great places to start for getting introduced and, and sort of getting your feet wet and, and getting acclimated to reading some of these um, historical figures. What about a little book on the Christian law? I was just going to say, may I plug one? Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the resources Ligonier has made available is Calvin's Golden Booklet on the Christian Life, which was a piece that was pulled out of the Institutes. And it really shows uh, that Calvin who's often seen as this sort of ivory tower theologian, it really shows how practical Calvin is and how he really, yeah, he wrote the Institutes as a text for beginners in the Christian faith. And in our moment, it's sort of a seminary textbook. Like we've flipped it around a little bit. But yeah, Golden Booklet on the Christian Life is just a, it's a wonderful entry small, not intimidating, and very rewarding. And Drs. Denlinger and Drs. Pars uh, Dr. Parsons, they did a fresh translation. Um, so fresh it's under the title, A Little Book on the Christian Life. Yes. It's on Amazon, Ligonier.org. Uh, really, really helpful resource. Well, Lily has a question. Lily's watching on YouTube. 
and she'd like to know what suggestions do you have for someone who wants to read theology but is a slow reader and struggles to focus while reading? Just read slowly. You know, I often think sometimes we should read less more <laughs> and read more less. <laughs> because sometimes when we read more, our mind wanders, we miss things, we're not really thinking about what we're reading. And it's, you know, sometimes we need to do that. We're not, we just, we need to get through a book and we sort of plow through a book. But if we're talking about learning and we're talking about studying and we're talking about learning theology, it's okay to read less with more attention and you might find you get more out of it. I have, I have paragraphs in Edward's History of Work of Redemption that I just go to. I keep one handy right where I sit for my meetings and I try sometimes to schedule 15 minute intervals between meetings and I find it helpful to just sort of disengage from all the clamor of the day, pull out my nice copy of History of Work Redemption, go right to any number of asterisk paragraphs, and just read it. Um, and there, just, just read less and read slowly, it's okay. And the other thing is, I'll use a quote from Dr. Sproul. He, he, I think it was from Peter Drucker that he was talking about where he'd say, you know, people overestimate what they can do in a year, but they underestimate what they can do in five years. There's no timeline here. Take 10 years to study. Take three years to study. So just take your time and you'll make progress and you'll also get acclimated and you'll see vocabulary that will become familiar and phrases and turns of phrases that become familiar. But there's nothing wrong with reading slowly and reading less and really letting it get into the head uh, and get into the heart and get into the, the whole person. So piggybacking on that question, we have a whole generation that doesn't really read Right. And we're watching YouTube, they're watching things like this. Hopefully they're only watching things like this. Uh, but there's so much we can just swipe on our devices and we're just scrolling and watching, you know, garbage really. Um, and when it comes to the question of reading, some people just say, I'm not a reader. Hmm. So do you have general tips about how you can become a reader? Because you're an author and you're a reader. You even just said in between meetings, you might just read for 15 minutes. Um, and that's not generally the way, say, maybe a 20-year-old is living today. But if they really want to say, I, I want to read, any practical tips for them? Well, I, I would say start with something where your interest is. So if you have an interest in a particular topic, get some advice, find out a good book on that topic, and start there. So, you know, I, I go to church history figures that I care about and I find interesting. So I already have a motivation to get something from this. And so I'd say start with the topic that you're interested in. And again, it doesn't have to be a whole lot. It, it can be a little, it can be piecemeal. Um, this might be a little quirky, but I like, I like the actual book. So I much prefer a well-published book over a poorly published book, because I like the experience of, of reading a good book. Um, so it, it might be something to that effect as well. Uh, that could encourage the reading. Um, but I, I think there are some practical things you could do. Setting aside some time, uh, you could do this, and I, I do this. I never spend a half hour with Edwards. And at the end of that half hour, I say to myself, oh, that was a waste of time. Um, so do a little experiment with yourself. Spend a half hour swiping, catching up on your news feeds and what all your friends are posting on Instagram, and then spend a half hour with Edwards and see how you feel after the uh, half hour's up. Uh, so, you know, the challenges are there for us to use our time profitably, and we don't want to be bookworms. We do need to be real people, and we do need leisure and all those things. But I, I think we can be bettered by spending a little bit more time reading, and not just reading, but reading well. Uh, I, think it, I think it is a gift for us. I think a number of people will take you up on that 30-minute challenge. Just try it. Edwards versus Instagram. I'll go 15. Okay. 15 minutes. Spend 15 minutes with Edwards, 15 minutes TikTok on Instagram. Challenge. 15 minutes on TikTok, 15 minutes with Edwards or Calvin or Luther. See what you think. Okay. All right. Well, Anna on YouTube is asking, what have you been studying lately? Have you enjoyed reflecting on anything in particular? 
Yeah, Anna, that's a great question. Uh, I try to have a theologian every year I spend time with, and because it's the anniversary year of Machen, I decided to hop in and get back to some Machen studies. So Christian liberalism, but there was a wonderful book uh, that was published um, by Daryl Hart, who's a great Machen scholar, wrote a wonderful biography of Machen, one of my professors at Westminster Seminary, um, on Machen's selected shorter writings. And it's all over the map. It's stuff on church and culture. It's, it's, there's an essay on there on mountains and why we love to climb them. And so it's just wonderful miscellany kind of things from Machen. So I've been enjoying that book a lot. Um, I also read for what I'm going to write, and I'm gearing up to write a little book on basically identity and uh, sort of a theological answer to identity. So I've been reading up on the Doctrine of Humanity, Doctrine of Man books, and not as much contemporary material on identity, uh, but some. Uh, so I, I, I tend to read ahead of what I'm going to be writing so ideas can be turning around in my head. So those are two areas I've been camping out in lately. Bible reading, I've been, I've been, this year been doing the Proverbs every day, and I've also been reading through the Gospels, and I just keep reading through them, and sometimes quickly, and sometimes slowly, and sometimes a combination. Um, so that's sort of what I've been reading lately. Well, this question from X, Brian wants to know, what forms of church government have characterized the church throughout history? Has any one form of church government been more prominent historically than others? Oh, probably because of the length of the Middle Ages, the most prominent form has been the hierarchical form of what we'd say the, the bishopric. And of course it evolved. Uh, but er early in the church, what seems to have emerged is that, say you take Ephesus and you would have a, a, a city, and in that city there would be house churches and maybe a converted synagogue, and then eventually when you get into the 100s and 200s, you have church buildings being built. Uh, when you get into 300s, 400s, you have Roman temples uh, being taken over uh, that were of, you know, formerly Roman temples that become churches. But you, you have a city and you have these various churches. Each of them have elders. And then what emerged very early, like 100s, uh, you know, the, the second century 100s, was a bishop emerged as the this, this sort of overseer, which is what that Greek word means, episkopos, as the overseer of the elders of that region. And so from the 100s, really to the 500s, the form of church government was the plurality of bishops. It was not a single bishop. You see this at the church councils. You see this early in the 100s with the debate over Easter and when Easter should be celebrated. And the, the bishop of the churches of Rome uh, had a view and the other bishops had a view and what was decided was as the bishop's view, so goes that bishopric. So that proves there was not a papacy in the early church. The papacy really develops later, and then come the cardinals, and the archbishops, and the bishops, and the whole hierarchy. But, but the basic Episcopalian system was, is probably the most prominent in church history. Now, when you go back to scripture, as people do, and they study church government, and they want to be faithful to the text, now we see different views, and largely coming out of the Reformation, so first comes out, uh, the Lutherans pretty much followed the bishopric with bishops. And then comes Presbyterianism, which I think you can see it at Calvin's Geneva, but it comes into full flower under Knox. And then of course the Westminster Standards are the promotion of it. And then you see coming out of the English Reformation, the Congregationalists. So all of those are trying to make a case for their legitimacy based on the text. Um, and of course, they're great debates among each other. So from the time of the Reformation, the big three have been the Episcopalian system, the Presbyterian system, the Congregationalist system. But to answer the question, and I know I went very circuitously, uh, the most prominent has been the Episcopalian system. Yep. But it doesn't make it Right. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> I will add. <laughs> now, we've mentioned five minutes in church history, but your full-time job is not as a podcaster. Right. Uh, you are the president of a Bible college, Reformation Bible College, 
as you have young men and young women coming to Reformation Bible College, you've already brought up the topic of vocation, and so I just want to drill down a little bit on that. Sure. Um, how do you counsel and advise young people as they think about vocation and what should they do? Should we be doing a job that most aligns with our giftedness? Do I just do anything as long as it's not sinful? <laughs> like, how do, how do you yeah. counsel young people when it comes to vocation? Yeah, well, one of the courses we wrote into the curriculum was a course called Vocation, and we offer it to seniors. We're gonna change that up moving forward and push it into the junior year because I think it's helpful for them to have it a little bit earlier. But we actually start that course with R.C. Sproul's The Holiness of God, and they have to write an essay what does the holiness of God have to do with my vocation? So let's start there, All right? Let's think ultimately theologically about what I do. And now I can be governed by that as choices come along. And it can also be helpful to me that we begin to see there are many things that I can do. And some Young people now may have multiple careers in multiple fields, as we understand the marketplace these days, in their life ahead. And in each one, they can be of service to God and of worship to Him with a doxological, vocational work life. So let's start there. But secondly, it's just practical stuff. It's, you know, I tell students, doors open doors. You know, you, you, you get an education that opens doors. You get further education that opens doors. You take internships that opens doors. You make relationships with people who are in the business world or who have companies or who are pastors who, or missionaries or ministry leaders. And that opens doors. And you seek wisdom. Uh, you, you seek wisdom of families. You seek wisdom of pastors. You seek wisdom of those mentors that are speaking into your life. And then lastly, you seek the wisdom of your peers. <laughs> Sometimes we flip that around and they're just surrounded by their peers. Uh, so you, you open doors, you, you go through doors, you see where that leads, you get advice, and at the end of the day, you trust God uh, to guide and govern your steps. Um, I thought I wanted to be a college, well, from the time I started college, I wanted to be a college professor. And I just trusted in God to get me there. Somewhere along the line, I made the transition from the classroom to the meeting room <laughs> of administration. Uh, but that's what God had for me. I didn't foresee that. I perfectly thought I'd live out my life uh, teaching in the classroom. So we have plans and God brings things into our lives we didn't see and didn't expect. So that happens too. Uh, but I think as we're faithful in what God gives us, faithful in those steps, uh, we might not see five steps down the road, but maybe that next step comes into focus. And really, that's pretty much all we can ask for. And that's where God wants us. So we stay dependent and trusting in Him and not getting out there ahead of God. It's, it's a kindness of the Lord that we don't know the future. Absolutely. If we saw 10 steps down, it might be too scary. I can't handle that. I can't do that. And of course we can't. As you said, it keeps us dependent on God. Can I tell you that Edwards actually uses that same illustration, Nathan? Oh, really? Yeah. There we go. So you're far with Edwards. <laughs> so he's talking about providence as a river. And someone sees the river and like, well, how do I get from here to there? If only God would like take me up on a mountain and show me the whole river, I would trust in him. And Edward says, no, you wouldn't, because if you got up on that mountain, you would see rocks and boulders, and, and you'd think, oh, this river is never going to get there. So it's actually in God's kindness that we just see what's in front of us, and he is faithful to us. So you, there you are. You're keeping good company these days, Nathan. So. Hey, I've got friends who are church historians <laughs> always pointing me to good authors to read. It's paying off, I see. <laughs> Well, Rio on YouTube would like to know, were there any people who sought Reformation in the church before the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question, Rio. And we have to remember, God always has his faithful remnant. This is, we go back to the, there are 7,000 who have not bowed the, nail, or bowed the knee to Baal. 
So same thing's true of church history. Through these centuries, it's not Augustine and then the tap goes off and it comes back on at Luther and it's just darkness. And so God's always had his faithful remnant. We also have a moment of what we call the pre-Reformation reformers. And so this goes all the way back to Peter Waldo. Remember the old books, Where's Waldo? Well, he was in France. We called him Where's Wally in Australia. <laughs> okay, well, we were Americans. So <laughs> but the question of Where's Waldo, the answer is, France. He was in France in the 12th century teaching justification by faith, trying to uh, translate the Bible into the French language, singing hymns and uh, congregational hymns and doing away with all the priestly garb because not wanting to have this priesthood as the necessary entry to Christ. 1200s. And these followers called the Waldensians make their way into England make their way into Italy. They're little pocket groups that once the Reformation comes along, they just sort of go right along with. So the Waldensians were a group. You've got Wycliffe, and Wycliffe's followers were called the Lollards because Lollard is a low Dutch word for mumbler. And so when Wycliffe's followers were kicked out of England and they held services in, uh, in the Dutch lands, they, they would not be speaking in Latin in church, they'd be speaking in English. And when the Dutch walked by expecting to hear Latin, they'd hear English and they'd say, oh, they're mumbling. So Wycliffe's followers are called Lollards. Lollards are throughout the lands. And Lollard groups come up uh, at the time of the Reformation as well. There's Jan Hus and the Hussites and Bohemia, what is now the Czech Republic. So uh, there were there were reformers uh, before the Reformation. What they weren't able to do was get the traction. And so all of those people were martyred, except Wycliffe. He died of natural causes. And then his body was exhumed and burned uh, to make the point that he was a heretic. But the reformers come along and are able to you know, make it lasting and make it larger than pockets in a regional. But yes, yeah, certainly there were reformers and reformations prior to the Reformation. It's a great question. This week on Renewing Your Mind, actually all the way through to Reformation Day next week, Dr. Sproul's teaching on, on Luther, a little bit about his life, a little bit about the Reformation, the yeah. here I stand yeah. moment. One thing that I found interesting about Luther's life and his, just his story is his introspection how aware he was of his sinfulness and his need to confess his sin at that time in his life to the priests. And as soon as he would leave, he'd have to come back because he remembered yeah. some other sin. Hours on end confessing yes. his sin. When we think about that, that introspection, how should a Christian today relate to that? Should we be that introspective? How does that relate to the doctrine of justification by faith alone? How much should we spend looking inside ourselves and reflecting on our sin, particularly in a way that seemed very crippling for Luther at that stage in his life. Yeah. So, you know, when Luther was doing that, he, he was unaware of the doctrine of justification. All Luther, Luther's a classic example of one step forward and two steps back. And so the step forward he takes is that the problem is not my sins. Everybody, all his contemporaries, sin and grace was quantified. So as long as I have more graces than sins, I'm okay. And that's why we have the saints, because saints have more graces than they need. And so we can appeal to their graces on our behalf. And of course, at the top of the chain is the one who is full of grace, and that's Mary. So Luther, though, comes to the realization, the problem is not my sins. Well, I mean, that's a problem. But the real problem is I'm a sinner at the root. And no matter what I do for penance, I can never satisfy a, a holy and a righteous God. And so what does he say? I hate righteous God. Well, that's, a, that's two steps back. Uh, then he realizes, ah, uh, it's not my righteousness, it's Christ's righteousness. And he calls it a breakthrough. So those uh, marathon confessional moments were in that pre-conversion. We need to remember that. But I think, secondly, your question about introspection is a good one. It's just not Luther. We find it in the Puritans. And so I think what we have to remember is, well, I'll go back to Edwards. 
He wrote a letter. Deborah Hathaway was converted in one of the towns where Edwards preached, and that town was without a pastor for a while. So she writes a letter to Edwards saying that she and some of her basically teenage friends are needing guidance in the Christian life. Would he be of any help? Nathan, he has a congregation of 500 people. He's itinerating all over New England on horseback, which takes time. He goes into a study and he writes a 17 paragraph letter to Deborah Hathaway. And it got reprinted as advice to young converts. One of the paragraphs says, um, never think low enough for your sins. Uh, like, be aware, you're a sinner. And so what's he calling her to do, right? Introspection. But then he says, but remember to think of Christ. And no matter how high the mountaintop of your sin is, Christ infinitely overtops that mountaintop. And so we've got to remember this, that the, the solution here is to go back to grace. Was a, the, I'm blanking now on the Puritan news. You know, for every look uh, we take to our sin, we make 10 looks to Christ. Murray McShane. Well, it was McShane, thank yeah. you. So, well, a 20th century Puritan. So, uh, as we as we look as we look at uh, our sin and take it seriously, we have to remember who Christ is, that our sin and guilt have been taken away, and that we stand justified. Uh, we God views us as He views His Son. That's what we have to remember. But I do think we still need to think seriously about our sin and take our sin. Seriously. Yeah. But before we get to our last question tonight, I want to remind those that are watching live that if you'd like a free copy of The Legacy of Luther, an ebook that was edited by Dr. Sproul and Dr. Nichols, you can request your free copy by visiting ask.ligonier.org slash offer. And that's our way of saying thank you for watching live and for all the questions that you've submitted tonight. Well, our last question this evening, Dr. Nichols, is from Jonah. And Jonah is asking, what has been the most gratifying moment in your ministry? And what has been the most difficult? And I'll give you the option to flip it if we want to end on a high note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's a great question, Jonah. I was trying to tie in somehow whales and fishing to the answer, but I, I, won't, I won't even try. Um, I think one of the hardest has been... Um, you know, in in our position, sometimes we we have to take stands, and sometimes those stands um, are stands really against people that we would count as friends. And so, I've not had a whole lot of those moments. I've not had the here I stand moments of Luther, but I've had slight moments where I've, that's happened. And those are just difficult times because we care about people and we also care about the truth. And when those two things are in conflict, uh, it can be a difficult, it, it can leave us with some difficulties. But now that we've dispensed with that, we can go on to the high point. Part of me wants to say, well, I'm doing it now uh, is the high point. Uh, but, you know, as I look at it, I think just helping people understand not who God is, understanding scripture, but I really think where we're, my passions lie, and I think where I've had some gifts, is in helping the church today connect to church history. So one of the most gratifying moments, or the gratifying moments for me, is at, at conferences or just, just bumping into people of kids who are either, you know, listen to five minutes in church history or one of the ABC books, on church history uh, where, you know, they've been introduced to church history through that. It's just very gratifying. And I always think, you know, what God does in those lives, those decades to come. And I just, you know, pray for impact. So that, that's the most gratifying of it, uh, to be able to, to connect with people and see that maybe they're helped. 
Well, Dr. Nichols, we, we're grateful for your ministry, and you have definitely connected us with church history tonight. So thank you for being with us. Well, it's been a real pleasure to be with you, Nathan. Always grateful for these times, so thank you. And I do hope it has been helpful for people.